Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Kevin. If you will join me, we'll begin with a prayer. Feel free to respond with the our parts. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. O Holy Ghost, sweet guest of my soul, abide in me and grant that I may ever abide in thee. O Holy Ghost, Spirit of truth, come into our hearts. Shed the brightness of thy light upon the nations, that they may please thee in the unity of faith. May the grace of the Holy Ghost enlighten our senses and our hearts. And may our hearts be cleansed, O Lord, by the inpouring of the Holy Ghost. And may he render them fruitful by watering them with his heavenly dew. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. So it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So a very quick overview I am going to move quickly. I hope that's okay, but there is a lot of material to cover. You might not worry too much about taking down notes. If you'd like, all the slides that I'm putting up here are also located on our website. You can go there and just download them, and you'll have these slides. Uh, If you need more information on that, it's at our table. So that might help you. Uh, In terms of keeping up, very quickly, here's the overview. First part is there is a problem, and we're calling it the heresy of emotionalism. Second part, which is going to be the bulk, is we've got to understand the problem. If we understand the problem, that might be half the battle already. And the third part at the end will be a solution to the problem. Along the way, we'll try to pepper it with some illustrative examples, in particular, highlighting some things from the message of Fatima, correlated to uh, this conference's theme, and also to the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So that's our plan. That's where we're headed. Let's start with... Houston, we have a problem, okay? It's a big problem, I would say. And it's a problem that I believe touches many of us. I doubt there's anyone in this room that is not touched by it. In many ways, it's even a bit personal for me because I have loved ones who are definitely affected by this, uh, this heresy of emotionalism. And you can see it. We have many, many fallen away Catholics. Many of our family and friends perhaps have left the church uh, Oftentimes, this is because they are seeking some kind of spiritual high. They're seeking a connection to God, and they're not finding it. So they go around. Oftentimes, you even see this with people doing the church hop. They go from here to there to there, or you find someone, they say, oh, yeah, I grew up Catholic, but I left because of X, Y, Z, an emotional reason. They didn't find God there. They didn't feel connected there, and so off they go. And Protestants like to capitalize on this. Okay, that's one of the ways it's touched me personally, is that Protestants definitely emphasize and feed off of this emotionalism. And church hopping is actually quite common and in some ways even acceptable among many of them. We'll get a little bit more into this when we talk about the history. But it's certainly not just Catholics. It's all kinds of people, whether or not they profess a Christian creed or not, uh, they're still oftentimes falling to this kind of emotionalism. A lot of this is because man is by nature a spiritual being. So we're going to get into this. In other words, one way of looking at this is that we have a built-in need to worship God. We have a built-in need to worship this greater power than us who has created us. Okay, we know that's the triune God. But when you talk about these, these other people who are doing emotionalism, they might just say, you know, that other being. You know, if you want to do Star Wars, they're going to talk about the Force or whatever else. New Age is really coming in here, and that's just it. Because so much of our tradition and so much of the richness of our Catholic faith is being eviscerated in these last decades that all these new spiritualities are popping up. Obviously, the Protestants are offering one solution, but you've got a lot of others. You've got the New Age movement. You've got evolutionism, uh, those who maybe want to claim that science and the Big Bang are their religion and their god is the god of chance. Uh, You have those who are all into environmentalism. I call them the Church of the Holy Ozone Layer. And Chris Ferrara dealt with that rather adequately this morning. So no need to go into that, but notice how it's infiltrating our church. And then you also have the occult. Okay, I don't know if you've seen this. I hope you have. But the occult is growing like never before. It is all around us. I mean, just the other day, I ordered some books. 
Catholic books from Amazon. The box gets there, and just the cover of the box was completely occult. With some new show they're going to produce called like Good Omens, A Devil and Angel. But it's just, it's just the occult is everywhere around us. And much of the New Age stuff, uh, the yoga, the Harry Potter, all these things, it's, it's seeped in the occult. It's like everybody's doing it these days. And a lot of it is because of that spiritual vacuum that has left the Catholic Church. And emotionalism is, in some ways, responsible for it. There's a lot of other factors, too. Okay? In giving this talk, I don't mean to say that emotionalism is the only issue. It is an issue and is sort of concocted and you know, congruent with a lot of other streams of errors that are leading us to the great problems and diabolical disorientation we're seeing in our church today. Uh, just so you can sort of identify, what do I mean by emotionalism? I think the popular maxims really catch it. So how often have you heard people say things like this? Follow your heart. Or just do what feels right. Trust your gut. Obey your conscience. Never talking about how the conscience has to be well formed. Just find your truth and live according to it. That's all you have to do. I know parents who say, oh, I'm just so happy if each one of my Children finds their truth. Okay, this is all a way of emotionalism, and I'll tell you. Just if you, if you want to see what where this goes to the occult very quickly, just some of those maxims. Google them. Um, you will be horrified at some of the things that start showing up when you Google these types of things. I put the most benign ones up here, but if you Google just about any of these, you will very quickly find some very horrific uh, occult overtly occult-like images. Uh, That's really the devil's law. The devil's commandment, he really only has one, and it's do whatever you feel like. That's another way of understanding emotionalism. Uh, As I said, it is constitutive of many grave problems. Not the only source, uh, maybe not not even necessarily the root, but it is constitutive, and it is one of the ways that it impacts us very directly directly in a conscious way, with all those maxims that people are saying. Errors against Catholic doctrine. We've been talking about some of these things against the four last things, Uh, the idea of universal salvation, that's fueled by emotionalism, Uh, the attacks against Scripture's inerrancy, it becomes how I feel about Scripture, what Scripture is telling me, regardless of what it tells the fathers or the doctors. You know, like St. Vincent of Lorenz was saying, Father Isaac was teaching us, what has always been taught. Okay, emotionalism is getting away from that because I'm placing myself and my emotions as the judge. Certainly a lot of moral relativism, which you know is rampant around here. Oh, that can be true for you, but, you know, I have my own truth. If if that's how you want to live your life, that's okay, but I'm going to live my life this way, and just don't judge me, because this is how I feel like I connect to God. And then everyone says, oh, yeah, I can't judge them, because that's how they feel, they connect to God. That's emotionalism at work. So you see how it's in moral and religious relativism. Whatever religion you think is the one that gets you to God, wherever you feel most connected to God, well, that's where you should go and find God. Oftentimes you're not finding God. You're finding a spirit, but it is not the Holy Spirit. Uh, The breakdown in the family, a lot of that is due to emotionalism. Uh, When you think about things like infidelity and divorce, even contraception and abortion, A lot of that is going back to how people feel about things. And that's why they're taking those routes. Uh, Neglect of the elderly, euthanasia, uh, this great effeminacy that is affecting us. Men absent from their families, and certainly one of the great evils of the modern age, feminism. A lot of that is all rooted, again, a constitutive part of it is emotionalism. Even the so-called transgender ideology, the sodomitical agenda, this redefinition of marriage, the gender confusion All of those things go back to emotionalism. Some great pundits of wisdom, I hear them saying, well, love is love. I don't even know what that means. Love is love. Uh, We'll get to that in a minute. But generally, it is one of those maxims behind this kind of emotionalism. All right, so hopefully you're understanding that there is a problem. And this should not surprise us because it's a very ancient problem. Its origins go all the way back to our fall in Eden. When the serpent, the devil, attacks Eve, if you read Genesis closely, you'll see that one of the things is that she saw it was pleasing to her senses. Okay? She felt good about this thing and eating it. And that was one of the ways, among others, that the devil got to her. 
Okay, so our fall goes back to this. And from the fall, we have a weakness to ourselves now. We have been damaged. This is called original sin. Okay, our mind is not illumined the way it should. Our will is not as strong as it ought to be. Our human nature has been damaged and weakened by original sin, and we'll all, we are all born with it. Okay? And that's one of the reasons why I would argue that pretty much to some extent, some more, some less, but we're all going to be affected by this heresy of emotionalism. None of us is necessarily immune to it. Like I say, maybe some less. Perhaps Father Rodriguez and Father Isaac here suffer from this a lot less, and some of us suffer from it more. But I can still detect it in myself. And I'm hoping that by the end of this talk, you also start detecting it in yourself to understand it and get a solution to this problem. We have to know ourselves. It's already come up. Know thyself. It is one of the principles of the spiritual life. That actually goes all the way back to the Greeks. Uh, The Greek philosophers like Socrates who said the unexamined life is not worth living. We have to know ourselves. So who is man? All right. How does man know? How does man know reality? I hope these questions don't sort of scare you. They're deep and philosophical, but we'll try to keep it pretty simple to give you just a uh, working and rudimentary knowledge. Uh, man is not something that just evolved. Uh, man did not come out of the cave. Man, we're not subject to chance. Even the Greeks who said we are a rational being, the rational animal, uh, well, they had part of it right, but it's much more than that. In many ways, we, the Christian church, has always had the right answer, okay? God reveals it to us. So we're a spiritual being. We're a body and soul composite. So we're the only creature that God has made. The angels are purely spiritual. The animals are corporal. But we have both body and spirit, body and soul. So hopefully nothing new here. You all know this from your basic catechism. We're also made in the image and likeness of God, Imago Dei is the phrase for that, and that primarily is referring to our soul, our mind and our will, okay? That's what that's primarily referring to, not so much the corporal body that we have, uh, although that's connected, and then certainly male and female, God created us. And that's also going to be seen here that emotionalism can affect men and women differently, not all the same because, well, we're not all the same. When we talk about the body, we're largely including, among other elements, I'm not going to list them all here, but your exterior senses, how you perceive the world. So your eyes, your nose, your tongue, uh, sense of touch, those five senses. But also the emotions. Sometimes we call those emotions the passions. Uh, They're also the appetites that we have. So the way this was done in classical philosophy is the idea that we have some things in common with the plants, For example, we live, we uh, grow, and we die. That's the vegetative spirit. Uh, We have some things in common with animals. We're able to move. We have instincts. Animals have emotions as well, passions. Okay, And then, of course, we have that part that makes us uniquely human. Um, And in all of these different aspects, our mind and our will, that's making us uniquely human. That's the Imago Dei aspect that, for example, the plants and the animals certainly don't have. But there's a definite order, a hierarchy of these And the devil likes to invert the hierarchy that God has created. So God gives us this beautiful order, and order is beauty. Okay, beauty is not just in the eye of the beholder, a certain element of it is, but beauty is order, the order that God has created in all of creation in the universe. Well, the devil always wants to invert it, flip it upside down. And so he's doing that here in the heresy of emotionalism. And as we know, we've been damaged by sin, and so that order, it's more easy now to get inverted. And what we need to heal that is God's grace. Okay, God's grace will heal that inversion, but we need his grace. Otherwise, we remain under the power of original sin and, quite frankly, in the realm of the devil. If you want to read more into this and really get into it, you can look at St. Thomas' Summa, Part 1, Question 7783 on man. He's going into that quite a bit. But again, I'm just giving you like a Cliff Notes version. So some basic Christian anthropology by way here of a metaphoric illustration. Here is man. We're going to draw him this way. And you first see that there are these two charioteers. That's the soul. Okay, you got your mind, and he can see. And then you got the will. He's blindfolded. So the will doesn't see. 
The will is completely relying on the mind to inform him of the truth. Nevertheless, the will, as you can see, has got the reins to the horses. So he's going to direct where all this goes, but he can't see. So the mind and the will have to work very closely together. They're clearly directing this whole operation. The chariot then is then your body. Okay, So there's the body soul. And then the horses in this picture are our emotions or our passions, which tend to pull the body this way or that. In general, the passions are divided into two main categories. We call them the concupiscible passions, $5 word, and the irascible passions. The concupiscible are six, the irascible are five. They usually come in pairs of two. And the simple way of do- thinking about it is a concupiscible is going to basically be about pleasure. What makes me feel good or what doesn't make me feel good? Okay, so there's the positive and the negative, and that's where the two pairs come. Some apply to things in the future. Something that makes you feel good in the future, you therefore desire it. If you think about it in the future and you don't like it, you have aversion to it. So those are two of our horses in the present. You like it, you love it. You don't like it, you hate it. If you think about it in the past and you liked it, it brings you joy. You didn't like it, it brings you sadness. So those are our six concupiscible passions, primarily dealing with that which brings us pleasure. The irascible ones deal with those things that are hard, that are tough to deal with. And so, again, you're going to have them past, present, or future. In the future, you deal with something hard, you need courage. Or if you realize, ah, I can't handle it at all, you begin to despair. That's the negative side. And in the present, you either hope for something or you fear it. In the past, we really just have one because it's something that was difficult in your past. You feel anger about it and injustice. So these are all of our passions. Now, As we talk about the heresy of emotionalism, I do want you to keep one thing in context, and that is that this is how God made us. So this is good, okay? I really appreciate the fact that earlier Father Isaac said, you know, anger's not always bad. Anger can be a good thing also. Right. When that horse is being reined in correctly by the mind and the will in the right way, anger can be a good thing. And all of these things can lead us to God because this is what God gave us. So, Yes, God can speak to us at the level of the emotion. Obviously, he's God, and he's giving us these emotions, and he's given us everything there that make us up to lead us to him. The problem here is that because of original sin and because of the way we're damaged, the order has been inverted. So instead of the mind seeing clearly and telling the will what to do and the will being strong and guiding those horses where they need to go, what generally happens is the horses get a little wild, little out of control, that's why we're using this metaphor, and they start going where they want. And the will doesn't hold them strong enough. And then we're being led by the passions instead of being led by our mind and our will. Or the mind doesn't see things clearly, okay? And that's also a problem. I mean, if the charioteer is going one way, and he should have gone down this way, but the horses took him a different way, and the mind didn't stop that, and the will didn't stop it, and now the horses are going this way, Well, now the mind might see clearly over here, but they're already down the wrong path. So you might be using your reason, but because you allow those emotions to take you down the wrong path, you're already subject to emotionalism, even though you think you're being eminently reasonable because you're being governed by your mind and your will, but you're already down the wrong path that the emotions took you, okay? So that's a basic layout here of the human anthropology and the problem that we have. Now we want to understand the problem. To understand it, we'll give some quick definitions. Historical origins, we'll spend a little bit more time on that, as well as some philosophical underpinnings and a theological analysis. Those are the four parts that we will move through. Okay, so definitions. Always good to have some definitions. And we'll start by saying that emotion is something that is connected to our feelings, our opinions, our thoughts, and brings a degree of pleasure or displeasure, as we said, the passions. Emotionalism is a tendency to regard things and make judgments primarily based on one's emotions, as opposed to the mind, as we learned earlier. It's a strong or excessive appeal to the emotions. And that's the key word, excessive. Because again, the emotions do play a role. As we said, they can be good. They are meant to be good by God. But if we give them an excessive power, then they run amok and lead us down this heresy of emotionalism, which is when we begin to permit our faith 
or our moral values or our religious beliefs, our relationship with God, to be led excessively out of due order by our emotions. And I think it's sad to say that from what I see and from what I talk to, most people are doing this. Most people are guiding their life of faith and their relationship with God based on their emotions. And that's the inverted order. So it's going to lead us into many problems. That's why we have all these fallen away Catholics uh, and everything we were talking about earlier. That their dominant method of judging something is how it makes me feel. If I feel forgiven by God, well, then I'm forgiven. And however I feel I can acquire that forgiveness is how I do it. So if I want to go to my room and just tell God I'm sorry, as opposed to sacramental confession, well, heresy of, emotional to, heresy of emotionalism tells you you're fine. Uh, if I feel this is the right way to do things or this is the right religion, then clearly that's what God wants me doing. And no one better dare challenge me on that, right? Because if they challenge me on that, well, they're judgmental, they're harsh, they are closed-minded, they're bigoted, and they justify themselves with more emotional attacks. All of those are emotional attacks when you begin to accuse someone of being closed-minded and bigoted and harsh, and we hear those kinds of things often enough. And just to show you how pervasive this emotionalism is, even the children of Fatima, who we've heard so many wonderful stories about this weekend, were suffering from some of it. If you know the story, Jacinta wanted to pray that rosary quickly. This is before Our Lady comes. So she would say, let's just say, Hail Mary, Holy Mary, Hail Mary, Holy Mary, and pray our rosary real quick that way, so that what? So that we can get to play, play quicker. See, that was already emotionalism at work. That's one of the reasons why the angel has to come and teach them to pray correctly so they can start getting rid of that, right? When he finds them, in fact, the second time in the summer of 1916, what does he say? What are you doing? Pray. You should be praying because all this reparation needs to be done and our Lord has designs of mercy on your hearts. So the angel coming is really changing them and you could say purifying them of this emotionalism. But if you read the story of Fatima, and do get that book, The True Story of Fatima, that Kevin was mentioning. I think I have it on my last slide. But it is a great book. I just taught a class to high school students, and we made that one of our texts. And many of these students knew about Fatima, but they learned a lot from that book. Okay? And so in that book, you'll also see how all the people were reacting to the three seers. And I'll tell you, as you read that story, you can't help but think everybody in this town of Fatima is reacting to them based on emotionalism based on how they feel. That's why a lot of people aren't believing the children. You can really contrast Lucia's mother, Maria dos Santos, with Jacinta's father, Manuel Marto. Manuel Marto, very calm, patient, really thinking about things. And by far of all the parents, he was the most supportive. Uh, Lucia's mother was not that kind, certainly in the start. She would go after Lucia and actually, uh, you know, corporally punish her because she thought, Lucia was lying about seeing Our Lady. So, it's out there. We even see it in the story of the three children at Fatima. Where did it come from? Well, we already said the Garden of Eden. Uh, If you really study pagan religions, it's largely just emotionalism. That is largely what the pagan rites were all about and how they developed their rites to feed on the passions of people. And then we took a step above that with the Greek philosophers, men like Socrates and Plato, that began to do more with their reason and get rid of some of the pagan emotionalism. Uh, And then, of course, we're going to reach our pinnacle after that with Catholicism, with the true divine religion given to us by our Lord and Savior. And so as we follow this trajectory from the pagans to the height of Greek philosophy into the Catholic faith, we do have a decreasing heresy of emotionalism. But then we get Martin Luther, And largely, he innovated, all his religious innovations were based on his own psychosis. Uh, If you know a lot about him, we won't go too much into him, but suffice it to say, he seriously suffered from scruples, and he had a big problem thinking he was not forgiven by God, and that God hated him, and he couldn't get over this. He'd go to confession, and then he didn't feel like he was forgiven. Uh, It was all about how he felt about things, and that really drove him mad. And he didn't listen to his spiritual advisors, uh, and he needed this more direct connection to God, a personal one, an individual one, without the church as an intermediary. As long as he could tell himself he was right with God based on how he defined his own faith, then that's the religion he wanted. So he put a lot less emphasis, or no emphasis at all, on the objective realities that exist outside of ourselves, and everything on the subjective dimension. 
on his emotions and his emotions governing his mind and his will. So things like tradition or the sacraments or the sacred liturgy or doctrine or the hierarchy, all these things that are outside of ourselves and help keep us from going down this path of emotionalism, Martin Luther is jettisoning them. So there in our little image you see how the devil is basically playing Martin Luther to his purposes. By the way, the devil would appear to Martin Luther uh, and gave him a lot of his ideas by Martin Luther's own writings. I don't know if you've heard about that, but Martin Luther had conversations with the devil, knew they were the devil. His arguments against transubstantiation came from the devil, uh, and Luther admits that himself. So uh, we could go into much, but then you have Protestant after Protestant, Zwingli and Henry VIII, governed by his lust, John Calvin coming up with a whole new theological system, uh, the Anabaptists, Menno Simmons, the Mennonites, John Smith and the Baptists, John Wesley and the Methodists, Joseph Smith and the Mormons, Charles Russell, the Jehovah Witnesses, the list goes on and on to the point where we're not even in Christians anymore. Uh, people would even claim to be Christians. you got Ron L. Hubbard with Scientology. And ultimately, this emotionalism leads us down to a man like Aleister Crowley, who's basically the father of Satanism. Okay, so this is where that trajectory of emotionalism takes you. You start with Martin Luther's Protestantism, and you go down a quick spiral, sliding down to a man like Aleister Crowley. Uh, by the same token, at the same time that you've got this stuff going on in the religious sphere, you've also got philosophy changing. And there's a lot of things in philosophy that went the wrong way and underpin this emotionalism. I'd say in many ways it began with a movement of humanism. And a maxim for that would be man is the measure of all things. Okay, so now it's no longer objective reality, the precise scholastic method of Thomas Aquinas that the church had built up, but the humanists were reacting against that. And then you had the Protestant Revolution, which we just mentioned, and we saw how emotionalism affects that. Then came that scientific revolution where man began to think that he could figure out all the secrets of the physical world with his reason. And so reason began to be exalted and faith began to be put aside. It was easier for them to put faith aside because there was all this interfighting among the Protestants. And it was hard to know which now was right, this Protestant or that Protestant or the Catholic Church. So there's a lot of confusion going on in Europe at this time. Then the scientists, the scientists and the philosophers that are known as the rationalists. Rene Descartes the first comes along. You probably have heard of him. I think, therefore I am. Cogito ergo sum is his big thing. And so they thought we come to know reality through our reason. But even though they were saying that, this is already the horses gone amok, taking them the wrong way. And you had the empiricists, men like Locke, Hume, and Berkeley, who contrast them and said, no, no, man is a tabula rasa, a blank slate. It's not his human reason that gives him knowledge. It's his senses and it's his experience. And so there's this battle in the philosophy world going on between how man actually knows reality, what he knows. And in the end, all of that is blown up by a man called Immanuel Kant. And we really do live in a Kantian period. People have, I think, accurately said that since Kant, uh, everything in philosophy is just sort of a footnote to his thinking. So he basically comes along and says, you empiricists are wrong and you rationalists are wrong because how man knows reality is, well, man doesn't know reality. All man knows is what's within himself. And so you think there's a chair there, but in reality, It's just a chair in your mind that you're sort of seeing and you believe is there. And now man is constructed a certain way with certain categories and sort of ways of seeing things. So most of us all kind of see the chair there. But what you really have contact with is just what's in your mind. And therefore, you never really see objective reality for what it is. There's always a level of subjectivity in it. The subject is always involved. It's not objective anymore. You can't escape that. All of reality has a subjective dimension because you're the one seeing it and witnessing it and processing it, this information. Okay, so that's just a real brief, uh, basic outline on Kant. I'm certainly not doing him justice, but we don't have time to go into Kantian philosophy right now. Where this leads you is things that you've probably heard. Perception is reality, right? Is that an old lady or is that a young woman? Maybe you see both there. It's one or the other, but it's how you perceive it. See, this is now truth, and this is now reality. What you perceive, you take that a little further, none of us see the world as it really is, but rather as we are. We're projecting on it, and that's all we're seeing. In fact, reality is merely an illusion, albeit a very persistent one. 
Okay, this is where the Kantian thought takes you, and this is out there. Start sprouting this stuff, and people will be like, oh, wow, they're really wise. And you can get right in with the New Agers and the Eastern mysticism. This is the kind of stuff they sprout. And this is what emotionalism is largely based on. Once you get to this point, everything is subject to change. Because man himself is changing. I do not see everything the way I did when I was five years old or when I was 15 years old. Or if some of us had a conversion, we're obviously seeing things differently. And if reality is all subject to how I see it, and I'm changing, and each one of you is different, and each one of you is changing, well then, there is no such thing as reality, because it all just depends on how I see it. This is Kant. This is where we're at then what do you have to judge objective reality? Well, you don't have anything left, so you go with your emotions, how you see things, okay? So this is where we've gotten to this point. Its effect upon religion, obviously some went down the road of what they called natural religion. These were men like the deists, and really this is where Freemasonry evolves, but it's already subject to this emotionalism. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. I just want you to see the deism, our founding fathers of this country, and Freemasonry do have its roots in these. But contrasting this natural religion they came up with all these people arguing about what is you know, the truth about God, with all these uh, fights taking place in Europe among the various Protestants, each one claiming they had the faith, we get to a point now with a man like uh, Soren Kierkegaard. Okay? So Soren Kierkegaard is a Danish existential philosopher and he brings in Kant's idea into religion. He was pretty frustrated with organizing, organized religion, the Lutheran church up in Denmark. He saw a lot of hypocrisy among the people who claimed to be, you know, good Christians. And he begins to say experience has priority over dogma. It's a lot less about dogmatic beliefs, and it's about your experiences. He's the one who comes up with this idea that there's a difference between faith and belief. Because faith is your feelings, your feelings of trusting God. Whereas belief are those dry, abstract dogmas that are not nearly as important as this leap of faith you have to make based on your emotions and how you feel connected to God. It's your personal choice and your commitment to God that's important as opposed to the dogmas you believe or through what organized religion you might want to come to God. So this is Soren Kierkegaard. And he really does revolutionize religion because what he's basically doing is he's exalting this emotionalism that we're talking about. To him, that becomes religion. And hopefully you can see that in Kierkegaard's thought, how he brings Kant into religion is how people today are understanding their religion mostly, by and large, to some extent or another. And that's why you have so many people leaving the Catholic Church. A real key example that sort of highlights this is the history of Pentecostalism. Some of you might be aware of this. It grew out of Wesley, uh, the Methodists. There was a Wesleyan holiness revival movement in the 19th century, mostly in the United States and also in England. Uh, there was this idea among Wesley that the first work of grace, okay, this is all wrong theology. I'll just mention it very quickly, but the first work of grace is salvation, so I have so many Protestants running around saying, are you saved? That's the work of grace. Oh, yes, I'm saved. Okay, that's great. You're good. But some people started realizing, well, that doesn't seem quite enough. So Wesley comes up with the second work of grace, which is now entire sanctification. So it's, are you saved? Yes, I'm saved. Ah, but are you sanctified? So that becomes the next question. Okay, and this holiness movement really works on that. So you have a man like Charles Fox Parham, who talks about the third work of grace is baptism by the Holy Spirit. Okay, this. So these are the three works of grace. And how do you know if you're baptized by the Holy Spirit? Well, they believed in an imminent second coming. Christ is coming. The world is ending. And therefore, the Holy Spirit is pouring out his apostolic gifts on us again. And we're going to be speaking in tongues. And we're going to be prophesying. And we'll be doing healings and miracles. And all these things are going on. And, and that's how you know if you've been baptized by the Holy Ghost. And so this entire sanctification process has to take place in this, this show this religious show. One of his disciples was a man named William J. Seymour, and he famously had a little rundown church on Azusa Street in Los Angeles, L.A. of all places. See, even back then in 1906, crazy stuff is coming out of L.A. So for about 10 years, they have this Azusa Street revival, 
And I just want to read to you from then, the 1906 L.A. Times. This is how they're describing what's going on there on Azusa Street, this Pentecostal holiness revival movement with the third works of grace. As you listen to it, it might not just sound like it's 1906. Maybe you're familiar with some of these things. Quoting the L.A. Times. Breathing strange utterances and mouthing a creed, which it would seem no sane mortal could understand, the newest religion sect has started in Los Angeles. Meetings are held in a tumble-down shack on Azusa Street, and the devotees of this weird doctrine practice the most fanatical rites, preach the wildest theories, and work themselves into a state of mad excitement in their, particu- in their peculiar zeal. Night is made hideous in the neighborhood by the howlings of the worshipers who spend hours swaying back and forth in a nerve-wracking attitude of prayer and supplication. They claim to have the gift of tongues and to then be able to understand the babble. They run, they jump, they shake all over. They shout at the top of their voice. They spin around in circles. They fall out on the sawdust blanketed floor, jerking, kicking, and rolling over it. Some of them pass out. They do not move for hours as though they were dead. These people appeared to be mad, mentally deranged, or under a spell. They claim to be filled with the Spirit. That's Pentecostalism. That's his holiness movement. Does any of this sound familiar? This is where emotionalism is leading us, okay? And this is not the Holy Ghost. It is a spirit. And I do believe these people had a spirit. But again, it's not the Holy Spirit. There is only one Holy Ghost, the one triune God. There's a lot of evil spirits running around. Uh, And when you go down this path of emotionalism and the order gets inverted, not the way God created, that opens the door to many, many demonic and occult forces. So, So it doesn't surprise me that the occultism is growing as well. With all these kinds of stuff, how does one know if religion is real? Well, you've got to feel it. And you have to prove it to others. You've got to show it. Hence the spinning around, the jerking, the talking in this tongues, and this babble, okay? Uh, You either are faking it, or if it's real, it might very well be because some spirit has taken possession of you. But you want to get that rise. You want that spiritual high, and there is a spiritual high there, okay? Um, The exercise of religion now is easily becoming a big show because you've got to prove it. It's very easy to manipulate people in religion when they're trying to make it a show. And there's also a great deal of uncertainty. If you talk to people who have been in things like this and have come out, they'll say, I never knew uh, if I was right with God or what was certain. I was trying to. I was trying to be like the others. I wanted, you know, I saw them having these gifts, and so I wanted to have the gifts too. So I start, you know, doing whatever it is to get the gifts. God often appears to them very emotional, very volatile and hence also untrustworthy. There's a lack of sure knowledge about God, confidence, stability, and ultimately a lack of peace, which is ironic because that's exactly what they are striving to get. Okay, so this is where emotionalism is taking us, a great deal of manipulation with religion, lack of certitude about God because we've gotten rid of all those objective dimensions that the Catholic Church gives us. In this time of diabolical disorientation, this is particularly pernicious uh, because grace is lacking right now, as you know, Father Isaac's talk and the others have just mentioned. And since grace is lacking, we're so much more easily prey to be, to, it's so much easier for us to succumb and to fall prey to these kinds of religious deceits, especially when you're trying to find some kind of uh, you know, spiritual life. What's really interesting, I thought, is while this movement was growing, you know, while those things are going down in Azusa Street, if you saw the years, what else is happening? Our Lady is coming at Fatima. Right? Our Blessed Mother is coming, and she's showing us the true path to our Lord. As we mentioned briefly, sort of getting rid of any emotionalism, heresy, leanings that way that children might have, and showing them what the true path is. The angel is coming to them and teaching them how to pray correctly, getting them focused back on the four last things, on all the truths of the faith, as Father Rodriguez was talking about yesterday, on the Holy Eucharist, all those things that are stable, that show us that God is unchanging his truth. 
So she comes to help us battle against this great instability. It's like she knew this time was coming of diabolical disorientation when grace would be lacking and so many could be falling prey to emotionalism. So she's appearing at this time giving us light. Unfortunately, many people are attracted by the showiness. They like the miracles. They like the healings. But you've really got to be careful because the devil is a master deceiver. As St. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, he appears as an angel of light. Lucifer, that's what he was, an angel of light in the beginning before he fell. He still has those tricks. And the devil is very happy doing some nice things and doing some apparently good things to sort of lure you in and take you down that path. So you want a little spiritual high? He'll give it to you. And then he's got you there somewhere else. It's not the one holy Catholic apostolic church outside of which there's no salvation. And you're thinking, oh, I'm doing good things because I'm following, you know, this emotional, this spiritual high, this feeling I've got. That person was doing miracles or healings or talking in tongues. And I saw the person slain in the spirit and all kinds of things like this. Okay. That's going on with the devil. In fact, if you read, again, the story of Our Lady of Fatima, Lucia was attacked by the devil. He was preying on her emotionalism. She almost missed the 13th July, 1917, when she gets the vision of hell and the secret of Fatima. The day before, she had told Francisco and Jacinta, I'm not going. Why? Because she had been talking to people. Her mother had taken her to see the parish priest. The parish priest started prodding. The parish priest said, you know, it might be the devil who's appearing to you. It might be the devil who's tricking you. And that got in her mind and started working. And then she had terrible dreams. She had nightmares. Like the devil was dragging her down to hell and she was so scared. She's like, that's it. I don't want anything to do with this. I'm staying away. But Our Lady gave her a wonderful grace. And so she gets this overwhelming grace and suddenly she just knows she's going to go. And again, before she rewrote down the third secret, this is now fast forward to about 1944. The bishop had already told her, write down the third secret. She couldn't. The devil kept attacking and oppressing her, and she couldn't until Our Lady appears to her on January 9th, 1944, gives her this incredible grace, and that's when Sister Lucia was able to write down that third secret. So the devil is here. The devil is working hard. The devil's going to mimic these things. He's going to try to lure people if he can. And if not, he's attacking them. And again, one way he can get in is by looking like an angel of light and appealing through the emotions. It's what he did with Eve because that's not the right order in how God created us. So with that, very quickly back to our theological analysis. This is mostly repeat, but all of man's faculties are meant to work together each in its proper order to lead man towards God. So you do have a body, you do have a mind, which is meant to know truth, a will, which is meant to choose the good. The body senses beauty, beauty, truth, and goodness. According to St. Augustine, those are the three transcendentals. This is how God reveals himself to man, and he's giving us different ways to detect these things to lead him to him, but again, each in their proper order. See, our passions are also good because they're created by God, but since they're tainted by original sin, they must be governed by right reason. The emotions are not the faculty of judgment. The emotions cannot replace prudence or judgment or reason. They have to be regulated in their correct order by the will. And too many people are gauging what is right and what is good and what is true on those emotions. That's this big error. Your emotions are not the faculty of judgment. So God can, and he often does. I mean, if you read the mystics and the saints, they will have powerful experiences that do work on the emotion. Okay, God can touch us through the emotion. But you've always got to judge that. As St. Paul would say, you've got to discern the spirits. And you might have this emotional reaction, but does it really come from God or is it coming from somewhere else? Okay, that is also a very necessary step, which we'll talk about in just a minute. One way to understand this, I think this is a very simple way that we can all really relate to. In our human relationships, and we can focus maybe on marriage, husband and wife, because that's a common one for many of us. There are generally four stages, and you can cycle through them, okay? But the first one, as we all know, is generally infatuation, okay? We don't know the person very well yet, but what we see, we like. We see a beauty there. And because you don't know the person that well, your imagination starts filling in all the gaps, about what you don't know. And that's why you're so infatuated. It's like this person can do no wrong. This girl, she's so beautiful. She's wonderful in every respect, okay? A lot of emotions are working there. At some point in that relationship, reality steps in. Now you're starting to know the truth. You start seeing the defects in this person, okay? So once you know the truth and reality steps in, 
you can hit a crisis. You can go into despair. Okay, there is a crisis level. Is this relationship going to last or not? A lot of times it doesn't last, and the persons they leave. Okay, they couldn't handle the truth. If you get through that crisis, which requires a lot of sacrifice, okay, it's not going to be easy. You're getting to a greater level of authentic and true love. Okay, but it required sacrifice, and you got to pass through those tough times. And those who've been married for 20, 30 years will tell us that, you know, you can go through that a number of times, okay? It doesn't just end, all right? It keeps going, all right? Um, but you always have to have that level of sacrifice where you are really trying to love the person. And see, here's another thing. That love is love. I mentioned What is love? It's unfortunate that our English language is so bad because, you know, love can mean a lot of things. People say, I love pizza. You know, I love you. I love my cat. I love all these different things. Ultimately, what love really is... It's not a feeling, okay? It can be an emotion, but really, love is of your mind and your will. It's when you choose, you will, the good for the other person. The highest good. That's really your highest love, okay? So you have to know what that highest good is, i.e. their salvation, getting them to heaven, whatever situation that calls for, and then you're willing to sacrifice to help that person achieve that ultimate great good for which they were created. That's love, and that takes sacrifice, Okay, so it's not largely an emotion. Sometimes the emotions help you, and sometimes the emotions pull you away. You've got to rein them in the right way. Okay, so this is how this steps go. And in many ways, it's this way with our relationship with God, too. You've got this infatuation level. Okay, reality steps in. You hit a crisis. And what a lot of people do then is they no longer have the spiritual high. They feel like they're not connected to God. Now we get the church hopping. Now they go somewhere else, get another spiritual high. Over there, I saw some tongues, uh, but then that wasn't doing it for me anymore. I need another spiritual high, so I go somewhere else, so I can get reinfatuated. And now I'm all excited about religion again, but then I lose that there. And before you know it, you're into the yoga and the new age and all these other Eastern mysticisms, and you're dabbling in the occult, and that's why it's so big. But if you also look at this, I mean, it really shows a lack of maturity in our spiritual life, okay? Because it takes maturity to get through those four steps to the authentic love. Another way I think about it is, we'll use different words here, okay, consolations and desolations in the spiritual life. A consolation, this largely now is coming from St. Ignatius of Loyola, but a consolation, he says, is anytime you have an increase in love or in faith or in charity, anytime you feel true contrition for your sins, you know, you shed tears for those sins and you really want to convert, or anytime you really are filled with this love for God just for God's sake. And God grants these spiritual consolations one way, uh, albeit a rather, you know, simple way, but it's almost like that sugar that God wants to give you to attract you, those sweet things. Uh, the desolations is the opposite. It's when you're abandoned. If you're a little kid, I could say it's your vegetables. Uh, they're good for you, but they don't taste so good as the sugar. Okay, the desolation is like that. You feel abandoned by God. You've probably all heard about the dark night of the soul. You're going through that. And so that's corresponding. Like in the infatuation, you're getting a lot of those consolations. And then when you reach that crisis, it's a lot of desolations, and you feel God has abandoned you. But you've got to get through that. And see, the devil has all these different ways of attacking you Depending on if you're in these consolations or desolations, he, he works on you, and the angel, the garden angel, God, works on you completely the opposite. So St. Ignatius really gets into that and gives us really good rules for discerning that. I'll mention that at the very end. Uh, but these desolations and consolations are going on, and too often, people just want the consolation. And that's not what spiritual life is about. Because those don't last, and God wants us to grow in our love for him, and we're not going to grow in our love unless we go through the crisis, and we sacrifice for him, and we move to a deeper love with our Lord, okay? When you get those desolations, you need faith, and you got to persevere. That's the theological virtue of hope. You persevere, and then you sacrifice for God. That's that theological virtue of charity. So they're all at work there. Simple analogy. You probably all get this. Think about birthday parties. Little kid, he's, you know, one year old. It's the chocolate cake birthday party. That's all the kid gets, and everybody's getting chocolate cake. A lot of consolation, a lot of infatuation. Six-year-old, now he's just getting a lot of toys, wants to play with all his toys, right? Twelve years old, he wants to invite his friends over and talk to them. Well, by the time you're reaching our age, birthdays are no longer that big a deal. And they're primarily meant for reflection, you know, you're thinking about things at a little deeper level. Uh, you're not really into the chocolate cake or the toys anymore. And sometimes you're not even into hanging out with your friends. You might just need that time to reflect on, how did I get to 40? How did I get to 50? Where is life going? 60 and on and on. 
Um, See, you you go through a maturing process, and it's the same in the spiritual life. So we want to really check our emotions in dealing with God, because what you see is we're kind of coming full circle. You remember this picture? We just talked about decreasing emotionalism. Well, look what happened with the Protestant revolt and then the age of darkening where the deus and the empiricists are all fighting it out, and you go down now into what we have today, full-blown new age occult paganism. It's increasing emotionalism. So we got to this sort of high point in the history of religion and mankind with the full flowering of the Catholic faith. I would say largely that's exemplified in the 13th century by great saints like St. Thomas Aquinas, Pope Innocent III, uh, St. Bonaventure. And then we start decreasing with the humanism and the emotionalism gets involved. There's a lot of other factors that took us down this path. I'm not saying emotionalism is the only one, but it is a constitutive one. And you see it everywhere now. So, for example, we've talked a little bit about the Mass, but... I firmly believe this is one of the big things motivating the new mass. There is a lot of emotionalism going in the new mass. When you talk to people about maybe why they don't want to go to the Latin mass, it inevitably comes down to how they feel about it. They don't like the way they feel. They don't like this language that they don't understand. It's all about the me and how I feel and how I like it. Largely, this new mass is focused on man. Father used the word anthropocentric. But if I just have two words to describe the difference, one is anthropocentric, centered on man. The other one is centered on God. And you see it in many ways, from the fact that the priest is facing God to the fact that the priest is facing the people, giving his back to God. You know, how dare he give his back to God? People always say, why is the priest turning around for me? This is not about you. Why is he turning his back on God? Okay, but it's because of the emotionalism. Because I got to feel good, and so I want to play a part, and I want to go to the one where I like the music, and I want to go to the one that's convenient. I can't do the sacrifice of driving further, or I can't this, or I can't that, but it's all about how it makes me feel. And then people even hop from one parish to another, depending on the Nova Soul, you got so much variety. Everyone's always church hopping to find the one they like, and the one that makes them feel good. And priests are trying to make it so that they feel good, and you got all these parish ministries to make you feel good about your faith. It's emotionalism run amok. I could go on on this, but we don't have time right now. And again, we have more CDs in the back because we've given more lengthy talks on the Mass. Uh, But emotionalism is definitely at work in these two, okay, in taking us to the new Mass because we're becoming more and more Protestant in our thinking. That's why we're changing our doctrines and everything is subject to change. There's no longer that stability and permanence that we get from God. And we also see in the traditional mass. So that's just one illustrative example. We can talk about Fatima as well. Remember when Our Lady asks them, the children, if they're willing to suffer to save souls, and and they say yes, that they're willing to pray for souls, and she says, you are going to suffer a great deal. Okay, see that? No no one likes that. It's not easy to suffer, and it's not fun to suffer. So if you're giving into emotionalism, you're going to run away from the suffering. You're going to run away from the cross. It's the hard part. Okay, Uh, but she promises them God will be your comfort. All right, that's the other part. So there'll be a great deal of suffering. God will be your... When you read that little book, especially just the true story of Fatima, I'm amazed at how much those children are willing to suffer. I mean, they were literally looking for ways to suffer. And they put us to shame. I mean, they put me to shame. I don't know if they put you to shame, but they put me to shame when I read all the different things that those three children are willing to do and ways that they're willing to suffer and, you know, the pain that they go through, Francisco and Jacinta and Lucia all her life. I mean, they suffered a lot. They kept telling themselves no for a higher good, no to their emotions and their passions because they wanted to save souls. That's how they're helping save souls. You know, I wonder sometimes... Jacinta always praying for souls falling into hell because she wanted to save them, right? She did a lot of sacrifices. I sometimes wonder, maybe, maybe some of those sacrifices Jacinta made got a grace for me to find the Latin Mass. Maybe some of us are here sitting in this room right now. Maybe some of us are going to get to heaven where we should have fallen out of hell except for the fact that Jacinta or Lucia or Francisco were winning graces for us because they want graces. But you don't see that. You don't feel it. That's not going to be based on the emotion. You're being guided by your faith in that way. There are clearly some people, maybe they're saints, maybe they're hidden saints, but there are people who want the graces. Each one of us is here because of the grace of God. Somebody had to pay for that grace. Somebody had to win that grace. And if we follow this heresy of emotionalism, we're not winning graces because we're giving in to what's easy and we're not willing to sacrifice 
And we're not willing to truly love because we just want the infatuation. We just want the sugar. So, solution to the problem. Here we reach the end. Um, obviously, you have to identify the problem. We've tried to do that. I think that's the biggest part of the battle because if you identify the problem, just reverse it. Just do the opposite, and you're going to be working yourself out of that problem. You have to know yourself, as we mentioned. You have to hear his voice, the good shepherd's voice. You have to be guided by the Holy Ghost, and you need proper discernment. So just remember in our picture, you've got to be conscious of this. You've got to ask yourself, am I being guided by my emotions right now, or is this really my mind and my will acting correctly? So my mind being guided by truth and my will really choosing the good. I mean, in your course of action, are you asking yourself a simple question? Is this helping me get to heaven? Or with a loved one, whoever it is you're dealing with, will this course of action actually help them to get to heaven? We, we've got to stop ourselves and ask that question. Hopefully our truth is, our mind is formed correctly, but you've got to ask yourself that question too. Okay? And again, don't let those emotions guide you. The emotions can help when God's giving you a consolation, but when there's a desolation, the emotions are not going to help. And you've got to persevere through that crisis in the relationship, like we said, to sacrifice and get to a deeper love. So you've got to know yourself, know how you work. Remember that picture. Hopefully it will help. And then you've got to hear his voice. Right? So the good shepherd, we know this passage. The shepherd goeth before the sheep, and the sheep follow him, because they know his voice. But a stranger they follow not, but fly from him, because they know not the voice of strangers. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come, that they may have life, and may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd, and I know mine, and mine know me. As the Father knoweth me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for my sheep, and other sheep I have that are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. John chapter 10. Go back and meditate on that. Take that to your mental prayer because the world, I'm telling you, the world does not know him. The world does not know his voice and far too often, in many respects, we don't know his voice. So we've got to start doing a better job of tuning ourselves to our shepherd, our good shepherd's voice because there are a lot of thieves and there are a lot of hirelings and there are a lot of wolves out there. And that's the context here. One fold, one church. Christ is only talking to us in one church. See, people start talking based on emotion, saying, well, God led me out of the Catholic Church into blah, 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 you know, religious sect group. No, that's not his voice, because he doesn't lead you over there. That's the emotionalism at work. You didn't hear his voice correctly. You have it right here from the words of Christ himself. There's only one fold. That's where he's taking everyone. They may not be in the fold right now, but he's trying to get them there. And if they know his voice, they're going to come. And if they don't know his voice, they're not going to come. And the thief and the wolf are going to get them, or the hirelings, you know, taking them down to Azusa Street and doing some things down there, all right? So we got to know his voice. How do we know his voice? Well, nothing new here. It's all pretty standard for you. Obviously, the sacraments, proper form and proper matter. We know that when the sacraments are done correctly, we're getting God's grace. So you stay close to the sacraments. Talk forever on that, but just, you know that. Sacrament scripture, rightly interpreted. So we want to be reading scripture so we can know his voice you got to follow divine and natural law, okay? That's his voice. He built it into creation. A lot of the stuff going on today, as we've said earlier, coming from the highest levels of the church, it's going against natural and divine law. That cannot be his voice. So we've got to learn that. We've got to study these things. Authentic church teaching. I put the authentic there because um, church teaching, especially these days, and diabolical disorientation is leading us astray. As Father Isaac had mentioned, going back to those principles of Vincent Lorenz, proper church authority, exercising its authority correctly, real good shepherds as opposed to uh, shepherds that are hirelings or uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. Look at the voice of the saints. Do your prayer. And on prayer, be guided by, for example, your recolta. The recolta has got all the church's traditional indulgence prayers. If you don't have the recolta, it's a great prayer book. Get it. So often people do the spontaneous prayer. And I'll tell you, spontaneous prayer, I mean, it can be okay and sometimes, but a lot of times what passes for spontaneous prayer is raw emotionalism. I'm just talking what I really want the person in the room to hear. I'm not even talking to God, if you've noticed that. A lot of people do spontaneous prayer. It's like, and please help Julie be a sweet person so that she won't be talking bad about people. And like you're, talking, you're not talking to God anymore. But, uh, so you want to 
ground yourself in good prayer. And I'll tell you, that was one of the biggest things for me when I found out about tradition. I started realizing that so much of the way I've been praying my whole life and I've been raised for 20-some years was, was a very impoverished way of praying. And I needed to get the voice of the saints and the voice of the church to guide my prayer. Now, even if I'm closing my eyes and praying during Mass, like the words and the phrases and the concepts I'm using are very different. You know, it is about how weak I am, how deficient I am, how much I need God's grace, asking Our Lady for the help, calling on the saints. So there's, it's a whole different way of praying. Get in touch with that kind of prayer. The recult is great and mental prayer is a must. Right, where you, for example, will read some scripture and you think about it and you pray with God about it. You want to learn more about mental prayer, we got CDs back there on that, so it's out there, the resources. But these are the kinds of things that will help you hear his voice. And then you've got to be guided by the Holy Ghost, the true Holy Ghost, not some fake out. Again, passage from John chapter 14, this is from the Last Supper. If you love me, keep my commandments. Let me say that again. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's so important. Right there, hearing his voice. The Holy Ghost is never going to guide you away from his commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he shall give you another paraclete, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, nor knoweth him. But you shall know him, because he shall abide with you and shall be in you. If anyone love me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him, and we will make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my words. The paraclete, the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your mind, whatsoever I shall have said to you. Peace I leave you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth do I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor it be afraid." So our Lord is giving us peace, but certainly not the way the world is. The world is giving you the sugar. The world is giving you the emotionalism and nothing but consolations, everything that feels good, and you think that's going to bring you peace? It isn't. It's very short-lived. It's very fleeting and transitory, and God is bringing us a far more lasting peace. So how do we know we're guided by the Holy Ghost? It is about keeping, our command, keeping God's commandments, doing our duty. We've got great CDs back there on duties of man, duties of women, duties of children. So you've got to make sure you know your duties. Earlier they were mentioning how that's the penance we have to do now. we got to do our duty. But there's that other side, too. The Holy Ghost will make his abode with you. It is about the relationship with God. And it is about the freedom you experience when the Holy Ghost really is living in you. Because then you want to do the good. And there's great freedom when you want to do the good. That's the real freedom God wants. The power to do the good that he gives all of us. So, we do need to pray for the gifts of the Holy Ghost. All those gifts are meant to help the mind and the will and the passions come to know God. So go back to your confirmation catechism, right? Wisdom, understanding, counsel, knowledge, piety, fortitude, fear of the Lord. Do you know what each one of those is? Make sure you're praying for them. If not, get yourself a Holy Ghost novena. Pray for those gifts because we need them. Otherwise, you're not being guided by the Holy Ghost if you're not utilizing the gifts that you were supposed to get at confirmation. You're supposed to be constantly enkindling um, sacred tradition. Right, the Latin Mass comes into play here again. We've got to stay true to sacred tradition, the legitimate laws of the church. You know, I mean, I've got a lot of little stories, anecdotes I could tell you. This was back in my Novus Ortho days. I was there too. And I'm in charge here at this parish, and this lady comes up, and she's taking hosts into a little pix, because, you know, they do that in the Novus Ortho, where people take communion to the sick. And I knew that she was taking communion to this one person, her husband, and, uh, but she has like three hosts. And so I was like, well, what's going on with the three hosts? The lady then tells me, well, it's because i got to give him one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and one in the evening. I'm like, you don't use the Holy Eucharist as a pill, like a medicine pill. And I told her, no, no, you can't do that. And you know what her answer was? No, the Holy Ghost told me this is what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> and I'm like, I can guarantee you the Holy Ghost didn't tell you that because he's not going against the legitimate laws of the church. Okay, you can't do that. So the Holy Ghost is going to lead you that way. Just like an oath. I mean, you've got people who make marriage vows. And then they come and say, well, I'm no longer in love, right? God's telling me I got to leave here. I got to leave. No, God's never going to tell you to break this sacred oath. The priest, uh, you know, Father mentioned someone earlier who, let's say, abandons their vows. That's not the Holy Ghost. You make a sacred vow to God. The Holy Ghost is never going to lead you to abandon that. These are the legitimate laws of the church and divine and natural law. I mean, side note here, but if you don't know about it, look into the oath against modernism. It's a very sacred oath that Pope Pius X wrote. 
And it really puts a stop to modernism. And every bishop was required to take this oath. And every priest took this oath. And every instructor to seminary took this oath. And for years, they're all taking this oath. And they renew it at the beginning of the year, like the beginning of the academic year. So everybody who was sinning at the Second Vatican Council took the oath against modernism. It's a sacred oath they made before God. You should read it. Take it yourself. You you can't tell me the Holy Ghost was working in all the things of Vatican II if some of those things of Vatican II go against the oath against modernism. That's like telling me the Holy Ghost is leading me to violate vows I've made, vows of baptism or of confirmation or of holy matrimony, or for the priest to violate vows of holy orders. It's not the Holy Ghost. So, the laws of the church, Holy Ghost is always guiding us in those things. You get deviated from that. That's emotionalism. That's heresy. That's the spirit maybe appearing as a spirit of light, bringing false consolations. Go to the cross. This is not about follow your heart. This is about humility and self-effacement. That's Christ. But our emotions, I don't know about you, my emotions never tell me go to the cross. My emotions are always telling me run from the cross. Right? That's in your mind and you will have got to step it up because that's where we are headed. We've got to follow Christ. No disciple is greater than the master. So we've got to be going to the cross. Your mind and your will are going to lead you there and the horses are going to go kicking and screaming, but you've got to take them there. Okay? So we've got to go to the cross. A great prayer, simple prayer. Pray it every day. Pray it many times a day. Dear Lord, help me to love my cross. I mean, if you're not praying that, it's so simple, but pray it. And pray it, like, for real. I mean, you got to mean it, um, because that's a big help in your life and all the sacrifice and penance and reparation, things we got to do, and that's not going to be emotionalism. And then, we've certainly talked about this already, but go to our Blessed Mother. Uh, and really go to Blessed Mother. You know, our message of Fatima is great for that. I, unfortunately, when I was in school, I knew this one young lady She was kind of into feminism, and she starts talking to me about Mary, and I couldn't believe it. I mean, the way she had Mary in her mind, you know, Catholic girl, grew up in Catholic school, but she had her like a modern feminist. And I'm looking at her going, that's not Our Lady. Okay, and that's a fake out. That's your emotionalism. You're into this feminist movement, and you're projecting onto Our Lady. That's not who she is. So we go to the message of Fatima. They do this with Our Lord also. Have you ever heard about this Jesus seminar in Berkeley, California? They went through the Gospels highlighting what Jesus probably said, what for sure he didn't say, what maybe he said. And when they cut up the Gospels, they came up with basically Jesus was a hippie just like them. Okay, again, it's just the mirror. Okay, that's not our Lord. So that's emotionalism, faking them out on who our Lady is or who our Lord is. So go to our Blessed Mother. You stay close to her with the message of Fatima. That will help you. And use proper discernment. So use the objective criteria, which we've just covered. A great book, if you can get a hold of it, do read it. It's called Trustful Surrender to Divine Providence. But that teaches you how to get through all these difficult times with the peace of our Lord. You follow that book, you're going to be doing well. St. Ignatius has got great rules for discerning spirits, how to know if something's a consolation or desolation. You'll get it in his spiritual exercises. Remember we talked about the role Martin Luther and the Protestant Revolution had in all this? When the Protestant Revolution is going on, one of the great graces God gives the world is St. Ignatius and the Jesuits. And they fight the Protestants, and they win back countries like Hungary, uh, Bohemia from the Protestants, and they did great work. Well, when St. Ignatius is praying there in Montserrat, Our Lady appears to him and gives him the spiritual exercise, as much like she appeared to St. Dominic back in 1215 and gave him the rosary. The rosary was the tool they needed to fight the Albigensians and many other enemies, like the Muslims and all our enemies, with the rosary. But a special tool to fight the Protestants and this heresy of emotionalism were Ignatius' spiritual exercises. The mother of God comes down from heaven to give him this. Just like now, she's giving us all this light and grace in Fatima, which we need at this time, okay? But so the spiritual exercises are great, and he gives rules for discernment. He's got 14. You discern the good spirit from the bad spirit, what to do in times of consolation, what to do in times of desolation. There's a real thin book, Rules for Discerning Spirits, by this priest. You can get it off of Angelus Press, for example. It's thin, but you'll read through those rules, and he's got great examples. So we've got to learn how to do this so that we're not led by emotionalism. And then, of course, the message of Fatima and that book, The True Story of Fatima, that I've referenced several times in this book, and Kevin has mentioned as well. In the end, look to the purity and the perfection of Our Lady. She's human. So she, too, had emotions, but she always regulated them well, so well that she's become the queen of heaven and earth. Consider her words at Cana. Do whatever he tells you. Think of how she stood at the cross, stabat mater, most sorrowful there. I can't even imagine what her emotions were like. I started thinking about that, and and really, I, I can't. Like, I can't even go there. It's so difficult, what Our Lady did. 
May we echo her words and live by her spirit, which was exemplified again and again, but seen so clearly at the Incarnation. Behold the handmaiden of the Lord. Be it done to me according to thy word. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.